Hi, this is Dr. Tom Moorcroft. Welcome to Full Cup Life, the podcast that goes behind the science of living well to exposing the truths and tactics to savor all that your journey to greater success has to offer to you every sip of the way. Trisha, welcome to Full Cup Life. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. Great to be here. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that we do on the podcast here is really I like to bring people in who have, a, have an expertise in an area that our listeners are really interested in, but not only just focusing on the physical aspects of things, but on the mental side of things. And I think that that's kind of like right up your alley. And it's just everything you talk about is just, you know, so uplifting. So I just wanted to have you maybe introduce yourself, let us know what you do and, and how you got to this point. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I uh, have a company called Heal Your Hunger, and I help people overcome emotional eating so they can uh, feel great without crazy diets or impossible exercise programs. So um, feel great and look great. And, um, you know, I was 50 pounds overweight, and that is really... I'd say the source of all that I do is the, the, the memory of having been completely out of control of food. And uh, from the get-go, you know, I grew up in the Northeast and I, uh, I was a little butterball as my friend's mother called me. Of course, I loved that. <laughs> Um, you know, roly poly, you know, all these wonderful, very right. affectionate words that make you just want to crawl into a rock. So, um, so anyway, I, I was, I was, I was overweight growing up and it was really something that plagued me and I didn't know what to do about it, except the things that you know to do, which is go on a diet, join a gym, you know, look into some pills and potions and lotions when you get a little bit more desperate, you know? <laughs> So the, right. these are the things I was doing and trying and nothing I tried worked. I mean, I could lose weight for a time, but I was a yo-yoer. So I had like five different size pants in my closet because I never knew where I was going to be. And of course, you don't mm -hmm. want to throw out your skinny pants because you really want to fit into those. And you That's did fit goal. into them for like five seconds. It's like, I want to get back there. So you hold on to those for years. And, you know, and I was really all over the map and... Um, and definitely a binge eater. So I would, um, you know, I'd, I'd get my, I wouldn't intend to binge. I would get, you know, ice cream and brownies and, you know, sit in front of the TV. But then I like, you know, with your sweet, you got to have salty. So I'd get some salty and, you know, some chips. And, and it just kind of devolved into this long, you know, three hour veg out in front of the TV and ongoing eating until I just felt completely stuffed and gross and mad at myself. Like, why did I do that? I can't believe I just ate all that. And, um, you know, and many people do this, uh, but for me, it was very common and, and, and I didn't have any control. So when I was, you know, around other people, of course, I behaved myself, but I was always obsessed. So I had the thoughts of like, oh, I want to have another piece of that cake. And, you know, I'm going to grab some more Hershey's Kisses, but I don't want to look like a pig, you know, so just right. it's, it was a constant obsession for me. And I, you know, because I tried so many different things, um, I got to a point, Tom, where I just felt hopeless. And I felt like, you know, diets aren't going to work for me because I always blow it. Uh, I always put the weight back on and I didn't, and I had already done like some more deeper things. Like I'd gotten an eating disorders therapist. I'd gone to a 12 step program, but still I can't, I pretty much had the same pattern. Um, and so I got to this place where I thought nobody could help me. And right. what happened was I found somebody who helped me on a different basis. And this person showed me how to really dig underneath that compulsion to eat and showed me how to deal with my emotions and have healthier tools like self-care tools to really uh, use uh, to address my emotions so my emotions didn't drive me to the kitchen time and time again like it right you know, Trisha, it, it, yeah, that's right d yeah it's a, you, the, the story to me is so I, I mean i really want to dive into like what you learned yeah. Yeah, <laughs> obviously because yeah. it's like what's that key but to me, I mean, what I hear you saying is, is applicable across the board. It's not just about eating. There's so many people who they've gone to all the clinic. They've gone to these different places. They followed this protocol and that protocol. 
it's kind of the conventional thinking and we just run ourselves through this. But then we feel, I heard you saying like you felt bad that you had essentially like tried and failed because we hadn't gotten to the underlying part. But what, what's it really, I mean, what's it really feel like? Because like when I hear you talking, it sounds to me like a lot of the people I see with chronic illnesses at, or just living life. And it's just that you sort of found food as your outlet. But like, let's dive yeah. a little, tell me more about that emotional feeling and what drove you to sort of binge like that and what the sort of the, what it felt yeah. like on the other end. Well, the feeling of trying things and having them not work, first of all, is terrible because you always blame yourself. You think what's wrong with me. There's something wrong with me um, that I can't do it. I can't get the diet, you know, and I tell people I talk to who have tried all these different things uh, they weren't designed to work like a diet fixes like just the symptom and it's, you know, the way, you know, overweight is a symptom of overeating overeating is a symptom of what's eating me. So I had to go deeper. And if, if I'm just doing a weight loss program, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm treating the symptom, not the real problem, which is typical, you know, for people probably who come to see you as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so that's a frustrating feeling. Um, and, you know, I describe it as kind of a hole in my soul. Um, you know, I had an emptiness and a, a kind of a, 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 just a hole. Like I just, you know, I was a social person. I was outgoing. I got a lot of things done, very accomplished. Um, and yet I, you know, at night was doing, you know, this, this binge eating um, and had this constant obsession with food that I couldn't really describe to anyone because, you know, people would make these very astute comments, like just eat more and exercise less. <laughs> like I hadn't thought of that, you know, <laughs> or, or no, I'm sorry, eat less, exercise, eat less, more. exercise sorry. more. <laughs> no, eat less, exercise more. Um, but, but, you know, thinking they were helping me and I'd be like, yeah, like no kidding. Yeah, uh, that's not going to fix it for me. So, but I will say it's, it's a lonely walk when you are struggling with something and people make suggestions that don't help, you know, or they, they keep trying to help you treat the symptom and not the source, um, right. it's lonely. And you do, you feel alone, you feel despairing, you know, and, and like uh, hopeless. I mean, hopelessness is basically where, it, where you end up when you've tried so many things. Yeah, you know, it's interesting too, because that's, I hear so much of that. And, and it is, I feel like, even like sometimes people will come into my clinic and, and I feel like, you know, they're like, oh my God, finally somebody's listening to me for the first time. Yet at the same time, they go do it. Like they go act as if I'm not listening and I don't really understand what's going on. And, and it's interesting when I hear you say that, I'm always reflecting like, okay, well, how can I do my work better to serve better? And it's like, it is, it's like, I mean, I feel like even when you see the answer right in front of you, there's this sense of hopelessness and aloneness because that's the way it's been for the last three months or five years or 10 years? No, no question. And with weight loss, it's decades. I mean, just decades of trying and, and yeah, since you failing. Were a kid, right? Yes. So, I mean, for me, I mean, for anybody who struggles with weight, it usually goes on for decades. So, um, you know, I think it does, it becomes your identity. Like I'm somebody who will lose weight and get it back again. And you do have to change. You have to change your mindset. Like you have to change who you believe you are, it's just hard to believe there is a way out when you've tried so many things. So I always tell people it's a different, you have to take a whole different tack, like get out of the diet roller coaster ride, get out of the diet mentality, right. go deeper, and then you can have a whole new world. Well, you know, it's interesting, everyone who's um, listening now, the thing that's really crazy about Trisha is she is full of energy. And she looks like she's been like super thin and fit her entire life. You would never know that this is her story. And the thing that's so impressive to me, Trisha, is that when we hang out, it is, it is like you have seamless energy, but eating this way and exercising this way and just living like this, this love coming out of you seems effortless. It's not Aww. like you're trying, right? No. And this is why I really <laughs> wanted to have this conversation is, because what, how do you make that mindset shift? Because in, you know, in my world, this is exactly the conversation. You just change eating and put some other word in there. There's some sort of underlying, I, I don't like the term, but self-sabotaging because like you said, you identify with being this particular way. I'm the yo-yo dieter. I'm the person everybody says this. I'm the person with chronic Lyme. I'm the person who my son or my daughter has pans and pandas and they always will flare. Whereas 
we need to see ourselves as something else. So with food and emotional eating, you know, where do you start? And like, or what did you learn? Because it sounded like somebody really kind of gave you the, the keys. <laughs> I did get so much help. And I will say in terms of this identification thing, it's especially hard with somebody who struggles with weight because if you have been overweight and you lose the weight, a lot of that self-sabotage comes exactly from what you're talking about is like, it's really hard to look in the mirror and see a thin person when you lose weight. And it took me years to overcome what I call fat head, where you just see a fat person, no matter what your weight is, you know, and you look at a picture and you like, don't recognize yourself. So it took me years to really outgrow that, that fat head. And um, so I, what happened for me is, you know, when I got off the diet track and I started to really deal with my emotions and I did have stuff from my past that needed to be dealt with. I and mean, we all do. And, and especially people who struggle with food and weight, there's trauma there almost, you know, almost every time. So um, not always, but a good part of the time, there's some kind of, some kind of abuse, um, which I had, I had sexual abuse as a child. And so, and, but it's not just that, you know, people always want to go to that one trauma like root that out and everything will be better. But what happens with trauma in my experience is when we have trauma, you know, as kids, you know, alcoholic parent, you know, a, a infirmed parent or sibling, you know, some kind of abandonment, abuse of some kind, when you have trauma, you have to cope as a kid and you have no idea how to cope. You're not talking, nobody's talking about it. So you're just kind of, you know, groping in the dark, trying to figure it out. And so you develop these other coping skills to get by and then, and they work, they save your life. So eating is one of them, you know, um, certainly drinking or smoking pot or anything, you know, escape, escaping in some way to numb our feelings. Right. And sex and even, even exercise in some people, like a lot of these people were telling you, oh, ex you know, eat less and exercise more. I'm like, well, maybe food is it for you. Maybe exercise is it for them too. True. I mean, <laughs> true, true. Yeah. So masturbation, I mean, there's, it goes on and on. So um, you know, what, what was really important for me is that um, I, start, I start dealing with those other, I mean, to be honest, other coping tools are just like people pleasing. So if you have an alcoholic parent, you know, and you're a rager in your, in your family, you become a people pleaser. Like you're, you've got your antenna up for, for how to deal with, you know, this, whatever's going on and how to mitigate, you know, the consequences of a raging parent, alcoholic parents, so you become a people pleaser. Emotional eaters typically become people pleasers, caretakers. Um, you know, we're, we're really good at, being chameleons, changing ourselves to meet the situation. And it all stems back from that childhood experiences. So, um, so my point here is it's not that one trauma um, or just that one trauma, it's sort of the um, consequential personality traits that we develop to cope with that trauma. And those, they kind of turn into a monster. So emotional leaders are, and, and people I think, um, who don't have a strong sense of self, which I did not, um, you know, they're always looking for their validation from it's outside of them. You know, they want other people to be pleased with them. They want accolades. They want credit, you know, because they're feeling empty on the inside and feel like they don't, they don't have that validation for themselves. So that turns into a problem in and of itself that you're sitting there, you know, trying to, trying to do all things, you know, be all things to all people. Um, and that, that creates more stress that we stress eat over. So my point is, it's not just one thing that you have to change. You have to kind of ferret out how, like, how am I living? How am I living? So that's like, what are the ways that I'm living that are creating my stress? And the good thing about that, right. Tom, is that you don't need 20 years of therapy to go deal with trauma in order to really change things right here and now. Um, if you start dealing, you know, I have something um, that I teach on called the anatomy of the emotional eater, which is 24 personality traits that make up the emotional eater. And some of these traits I just mentioned, the people pleasing and caretaking and overthinking and overdoing, you know, these are all some of these traits. So if we start kind of looking at the here and now, like what changes can we make here and now? How can we start, you know, uh, like pull back, put some boundaries on our time, stop saying yes to everything, you know, put, take time aside in the morning for meditation and prayer, you know, things that can help us bring more balance emotionally to our lives. Then we're not driven, like food is not our answer anymore. Food is not how we get fueled 
throughout the day, obviously appropriate meals, but not the excess food. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because it's like, I keep going back to this, but like everything you're saying resonates so much with, I feel like the human experience of like looking outside of ourselves for validation, somebody, you know, all, all the mechanisms you talked about to me were like very, I think when people start to feel like they let themselves down or, so, or there's something wrong with them. These are all mechanisms within you that are trying to protect you from a situation, particularly if you're younger when it happens, where, where you don't know what to do, but you're trying to protect yourself the best you can. But the thing that protected the four-year-old or the eight-year-old or, or the 10 or 15-year-old, when you're 30 and 40, pro you probably don't need anymore, but they're still there just because they, that part of you is trying to love and protect you. Yep, they, they stick to you and they're, it's like they're outworn coping tools. You mm -hmm. know, they, work, they saved their lives at that at the time that we needed them and picked them up. But as adults, they, they don't work anymore and they cause stress and they, they cause breakdowns in our bodies, you know, and, and that's why we have to take a look at how we're living. You know, I often say it's, it's not an eating problem, it's a living problem, but it's true. It's not an anything, you know, autoimmune, it's not whatever, you know, name the problem. It's not really that. It's, it's, we have to look at how we're living. So how, how, what, how do you start to make this change? I mean, if you were to give somebody like maybe, you know, two or three tips or places to start, things that really kind of unlock this puzzle for you. I would say uh, number one tip is slow down. <laughs> mic drop <laughs> right like we're all too busy i'm still guilty of it we're too busy um but it's okay to be busy but what we need is at least we need some kind of morning routine a way to get centered get like at least start the day with yourself and your divine being, you know, as mm -hmm. your divine being, as your divine self, your higher power, whatever you call it, start the day at least, you know, getting aligned. So I, you know, I can't recommend enough and I recommend it to all my clients, you know, um, and for emotional eating, especially it's vi meditation is vital, like emotional eating. Yeah. You can't just take away food. You know, um, I have this quit sugar challenge coming up. Like you mentioned, you can't just take sugar out of your diet. You've been leaning on it for so long. You know, what are you going to replace it with? And so, mm -hmm. so you have to, you have to have new tools if you're going to take away the excess foods. So meditation, you know, doing spiritual readings in the morning, just having a little ritual, you know, ha set your alarm for half an hour earlier. Um, you know, you, you'll be okay, go to bed earlier, you know, <laughs> and then just spend 30 minutes in quiet time, you know, some kind you. of quiet time. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, we, I just, we tell our kids to do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Do you, I mean, I think that like, as we grow up though, a lot of times we kind of don't, we, we've been, it's taking care of ourselves. Like you were mentioning earlier, we train out of people, you know, and really, and it's so many, and parents, I mean, as a parent, I know this and certainly you know, is we, we look at like, we have to take care of our kids and our spouse and our, and if we own a business or we're a teacher or whatever, we have to take care of everybody else, but you can't take care of other people unless you take care of yourself first. Absolutely. You know, you know that. I love what you're saying there. Yeah. When, when you make that change, Tricia, one of the things that I see people get uh, run into is people see you, not only do you see yourself as a yo-yo eater or the person with chronic Lyme disease, but so do other people. Right. So what is the experience for the emotional eater who makes that shift socially when, cause now you're going out as a different, completely different person. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, <clears throat> my clients will tell me all the time, like, you know, my husband eats crap, you know, what am I going to do? And, um, you know, and, and my friends, whenever we go out to dinner, you know, the bread is sitting there or whatever. And, <clears throat> my experience is if, if somebody is looking to really change their eating habits, don't try to do it alone. If you're an emotional eater, you do need emotional support. You know, if you, if you don't have the ability to just course correct and lose those five pounds and you're on your way, if that's not you, if you, you have a tendency to chronically struggle with weight, you have to get support and be among a community of other emotional eaters. Um, in my experience, because 
you know, being powerless over cookies, kind of a strange condition to have, you know? <laughs> and when you do it with other right. people though, it makes it so much easier. So then, then when you're out to dinner, it's like, oh yeah, my friends on my Zoom calls, you know, they're not eating bread either, you know? So I've got some camaraderie, I've got some support behind me, you know? And so, because when you're, because otherwise your head starts working on, you're like, I'm the only one not eating dessert. Right. Like, everybody's eating dessert but me poor me poor me and your head just works on you and then you're like screw it i'm gonna have dessert like everybody else and then i'll be a part of like eating dessert really makes you a part of seriously well oh i know i mean just i even think about the it's interesting how our our um i'm trying to come up with different words but our society has this thing called social drinking right i mean (laughs) it's just by definition it's like we all become alcoholics together (laughs) (laughs) right (laughs) so yeah Yeah. it's kind of an interesting concept because it's almost like it's it's these coping mechanisms that allow us to fit in it's like two things that are jumping out at me one is i fit in with other people Mm -hmm. which a lot of our family we go out like you know like thanksgiving i'm like literally the the table like the whole countertop is filled with the food and then it takes them an hour when we're done to clean that up. And then they just cover it all with dessert. Yeah. And they think I'm nuts because I don't eat it. Because I'm like, I mean, I might have like a mini cookie to just, you know, not be a jerk in front of everybody. But it's just like, it's not my gig. But it is, it's that. And then there's that self-soothing. I mean, are there, is it really just, does it go back always to sort of like that, that trauma piece? Or is, are there other things that people are typically getting stuck on? Yeah, that really well, trigger this. It's you know stress. I would say is the number one cause of stress eating, of course, you know, and comfort eating. And um, you know, people might not relate to having trauma or being an emotional eater, right. um, but I'm going to offer you a little tool for identifying some of the things that might drive the eating, um, just to kind of raise people's awareness, you know. And um, because people often say to me oh, I'm not, I'm not an emotional eater, you, you know, and yet they're carrying, you know, 30, 40 extra pounds on them. So probably they are, um, right. but the food is working. <laughs> so they don't know what their emotions are. They, they're not even aware. And the thing is, that's the thing about emotional eating is it's not necessarily binge eating. I mean, people are like, oh, I don't sit in t- front of TV and binge. But if your choices are always carby and sugary, you know, choices, that's usually for emotional reasons. Of course, pasta tastes great, you know, Um, (laughs) but the thing is, if it's always a pasta choice or a potato choice, you know, a heavy carb corn choice, um, we tend to eat heavier carb rich foods because they deaden our emotions. They put a, a blanket on our emotions. When we're feeling upset, we don't think of eating a salad. You know, we, th- we think True of story, chips right? and cookies, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but the reason is because those, they quell the emotions. Of course, they give us a serotonin, you know, hit as well. Um, and so those are emotional choices. If you prefer potatoes over broccoli, if you prefer a banana over an apple, you know, we, we gravitate towards heavier carby, more carby foods because they they give us a sense of calm and so that's an emotional choice just to kind of help people understand that well, you know it's interesting is i was just gonna say i love you brought in bananas because as an a-, a lifelong athlete it was hard to wean off of bananas and like i use bananas in a very specific place and i know we talked the other day about cycling and that might yeah. be one of the times because i take a big sugar hit but i don't even you don't even get get the big spike because you're actually in the middle of using it but outside of that I mean, I've basically cut them out of my diet for the last decade because it's just, it is, it's a big sugar hit. And then as soon as I thought the sugar hit, what you remind me of is, now guys, this is going to come out of left field for a lot of people, but bear (laughs) with me for a second. I can't wait. Yeah, this is a good one. (laughs) So when we have little children, boys, who are going to be circumcised, you can actually take a a little uh, gauze and they dip it in sucrose and put it in their mouth. And that will is enough to let you do the whole procedure oftentimes. Now, some people are nice, will use numbing medicine, but it is as a child, it is like a newborn. This is as effective as a narcotic in numbing Whoa. pain, sucrose. Wow, that's incredible. So this sugar hit 
it, it, it's like, I mean, I've heard that like sugar is eight times more addictive than cocaine, right? I mean, yeah, we are getting crazy. serotonin hits, we're getting dopamine hits, we're getting, I mean, you know, so it, it is, it's interesting. We are, we're, but, and Trisha, maybe, what has been your experience? Because I, I grew up thinking that Coca-Cola was a food group, right? That's just right. <laughs> what happened when I was young. And as I weaned off of that, it's like, I realized that the less and less sugar I ate, the more I actually enjoyed other foods and I could actually taste things. Mm. I mean, does that come up for folks in terms, you know, in your experience? Yeah. I mean, if somebody gets off of sugar, I mean, it totally changes your taste buds. I mean, people, people who eat sugar, you know, they don't like stevia. Like they're like, that's gross, you know, but if they don't eat sugar, all of a sudden stevia is tasting pretty good. But you, I always tell people stevia won't be good if you're still eating sugar, like, cause you prefer sugar, your taste buds will prefer sugar. So, um, but you know, if somebody's off of sugar, you'll start like your, your taste buds will wake up and you'll start like, you can eat romaine lettuce and taste the sweetness of romaine hearts you know, or, you know, something else that's normally one of my favorite foods right? ever. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Guilty. I love it. Yeah. Juice, I mean, the main hearts. Too, but... yeah, oh, I so... do. I love them. It's just yeah. like, you know, so um, my, and, and these are a little on the sweeter side, but my daughter will take a, a thing of pea tendrils, like the little oh, sprouted peas yes. and she'll eat a whole container of them. Wow. In lieu of like a dessert. Cause I mean, granted they're nice. a little on the sweeter side for a veg, but it's just like green and a, and, and a stock. That's you know, amazing. Like, <laughs> well, and you know, what's interesting too, Trish is like, I grew up not being introduced. They're like, Oh, kids don't like their, their veggies and stuff and whatever. And then they just like force these gross canned peas that my dog wouldn't even eat down <laughs> our throat, you know, but with our daughter, it's like, we gave her options of things and she just starts to eat it all. And she loves it. She still loves dessert. I mean, you know, and it's like her, my wife and my mom call themselves the, the dessert queens, right? But, <laughs> but they just take the, but, it, but it's, not, it's not like it's, um, I feel like sometimes what people are doing to try to get off of these things is to kind of put a stake in the ground, like no sugar. And, and like you said, like removing versus adding something. And I think that that's an important piece. And, and maybe we can dive into it just a little more like, you know, as a, how do we, how do we make that step from do, you know, completely shutting ourselves off from the thing that's been our pacifier essentially for a long time versus making that new leap? Is it really the addition of healthier food choices and the others fall away or? Well, I mean, I think again, it's, 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 you have to have a, a system for doing it. In my experience, it depends really on how much of an emotional eater you are on how mm -hmm. easy it's going to be to cut something like sugar out of your diet. Um, and so you're going to need like, like other tools to support you if you are an emotional eater. But, um, but for anybody who's ho hooked on sugar, which is anybody's hooked on sugar is probably an emotional eater. They're probably hooked not just for physical reasons, but for emotional as well. Um, I find personally that having good swaps is really necessary. So I mentioned stevia and, mm -hmm. um, in my quit sugar challenge, I offer a ton of recipes that are super yummy, but they don't have sugar. And I think that gives people some perspective on, because everything's, oh, if I'm going to give up sugar, my life is going to suck. <laughs> like, 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 it's going to be so boring. I am going to be boring, you know? And there's sort of this idea of those, right? like all of a sudden from, we go from technicolor to gray, you know? But it's no not kidding. true. It's absolutely not true. Like you can have really enjoyable foods um, with a little bit of sweetness and, and just, and they're, and, super, and they're healthier for sure. You know, sugar does so many terrible things to your body, as you know, and probably people listening know, um, that it's, it's just, it's not worth it. It's, it's not worth, you know, um, the price you have to pay. So the idea that we have so many amazing alternatives now, you know, ice creams without sugar, um, chocolate without sugar, and, and you can make things at home that don't have sugar. Uh-huh. You know, yeah. it's interesting too is when you're saying like, when I first started eating stevia, even I'd already cut most of the sugar out because I just, you know, I was so ill at the time, my body just rejected all things nasty. It was like, because I started doing yoga, it was just sort of, I started to listen almost by accident, you know, but I didn't like stevia. And over the years, stevia has become more and more sort of like, okay, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, and it is, there's certain chocolates and certain recipes where 
I mean, you would never even know there's not sugar in it. Yeah. But what's really cool is like a lot of people in my, in my work say Lyme disease. Oh, if you take sugar, you're feeding the Lyme. I don't think that that's really been proven, but what you're doing is you're suppressing your immune system. And what's really kind of cool about stevia is we're finding that for the last 1500 or so years, they've used it as an antimicrobial. And more recently, we found that some of the biofilms in our uh, infections agents that are protecting them and keeping them around, stevia breaks through this. Wow. So it's really, right? Yeah, it's incredible. Nature is amazing when you actually just go to real nature, you know? Yeah, that is super cool. I got to use that. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, I, just, I, I can't believe that like when we, when we decided to talk about this, I, there's so much overlap both mentally, emotionally, and physically with what, so many, what I'm doing with infectious, you know, chronic infections and what so yeah. many other people are doing because we're just people, our bodies are trying to, to thrive and, and our current society is kind of set up in a way that it's really not for, for humans thriving. No, no kidding. Absolutely. We have to get more and more conscious and, and more and more self-caring, you know, where we, and that's where the emotional stuff comes in is, um, you know, what changed for me and where I got my energy was digging out the stuff that was blocking me because we all kind of, you know, bury emotions. We all, you know, move fast and then things get left behind, but they, but they're not gone. They're just buried. Um, and so, you know, rooting some of that stuff out and adopting a practice of self-care, you know, and different self-care tools really have enabled me to just be happier, you know? And so it's just really, really important that we have the, the emotional and the spiritual um, to supplement um, the ways that food is serving us foods, you know, unhealthy foods or other um, addictions. And I just wanted to talk about the PEP test, Tom, because I think this might help people if they're like, what? I don't, I don't eat over my emotions. You right. know, <clears throat> we know oftentimes when we do eat sugar, we do eat too much food. We know what it does to us. But I always say it's also doing something for us. So, and this is true of any unhealthy habit is we have to look at what it's doing for us. So food, for instance, um, and, and PEP, I, I, I tell people to use the PEP test and PEP is an acronym. And the first P stands for painkiller. So we use food as a painkiller to kill emotional pain. And, it, and that's why we want the carby foods. That's why we want the heavy foods. It's not lettuce and celery we're, you know, we're snacking on. We're snacking on heavier foods. So they, they do deaden our emotions, you know, pain of, you know, a life circumstances, that, that, you know, that's, that's hurting us. Maybe a marriage that's, you know, needs to end or a job that doesn't fit us or a parent that's ill, kid that's ill. You know, I mean, there's, there's very legitimate ways that we might be in emotional pain, um, but the tendency is to douse that pain, you know, with um, some kind of unhealthy habit. So that's the first way that, you know, food, for instance, um, we use it. Um, to serve us, the E in PEP stands for escape. And so we use food as a form of escape. And I think this year of uh, the pandemic has shown us that because I think people are waking up to the fact that they're comfort eaters more than ever. People would never have called themselves emotional eaters. You know, people are, my friends are calling me up saying, I, I think I am one, you know, because all of a sudden, like, the news was so bad, like you can walk out your door and die, you know, so people are, are comforting themselves with food. So fear and worry are big drivers as well. Um, and the last P in PEP stands for punishment. And this is um, a little deeper. People won't necessarily relate to the idea of guilt, you know, eating over guilt or doing something else. But if somebody gets out of control with a habit and it's, and it's hurting them, you know, like my binges, I'd, I'd feel disgusting and bad and hate myself. Well, you know, why would I do that to myself? Is that really a treat? Because we think of food as a treat and a reward. But if someone takes it too far frequently, it's actually a form of punishment. And, um, and there are, you know, I always say overeaters are overthinkers. So we do tend to think things to death and blame ourselves and feel awful about everything. So guilt can be an underlying kind of unconscious driver as well. So just to bring people's attention, you know, we use, we use food as a painkiller, as a form of escape and as a form of punishment um, to treat or douse, you know, pain, fear, and guilt. And so I just put that out there just kind of as a starting place for people to realize that there might be some underlying things that drive our, our unhealthy habits. 
Yeah, Trisha, I think that that's like spectacular because that resonates with food and a lot of our other behaviors, you know, yes. so that is monster valuable information. So I think that, you know, the overlap is so amazing to me. And it's just like, this is a human thing. And we all, you know, need food to live. But, you know, it's like kind of like you, you eat to live, not live to eat. But right. um, I think that the tools that you're sharing with everybody are um, spectacular. So I want to thank you for being here um, for the podcast. This is amazing. And so if people want to reach out and, um, you know, touch base with you, and sort of learn more about how you address emotional eating, if this resonates with them, where's the best place to get in touch with you? Yeah, um, well, um, they can go to my website, which is healyourhunger.com, H-E-A-L, healyourhunger.com. And, um, and I do offer uh, something uh, frequently, something called the Quit Sugar Challenge. So somebody, for $7, so if somebody wants to get off sugar with other people, you know, uh, locking arms together and doing it and making it much easier and actually fun, um, they can uh, join us for the Quit Sugar Challenge. Awesome. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it and uh, all the best. And everyone, hop over to healyourhunger.com. And then certainly the, the Quit Sugar Challenge uh, sounds absolutely amazing. So I highly recommend you check it on out. Thanks so much for having me, Tom. It's always yeah. great to see you. Same here. Uh, the Quit Sugar Challenge is a really fun and easy way to get off sugar and start feeling so much better. Um, physically and emotionally as well. So, you know, sugar does all kinds of really bad things for our bodies um, and makes us feel bad and saps our energy and, you know, causes wrinkles and all those things. So, um, so getting off of it is a- I'm getting really off of it, it's gonna make me wrinkly. <laughs> Trust me, it's a big driver for a lot of people. Um, <laughs> yeah, so for five days, I offer a class every single day talking about, you know, um, the, the ways that uh, sugar is hiding in the foods that you even think are healthy, um, the ways that uh, sugar is hurting you that you might not know, um, and then how to, you know, quit and have delicious alternatives um, recipes that are good swaps for typical yummy foods that have sugar in it. Um, and also we'll talk about uh, something I call sweet sabotage, which is how we sabotage, you know, we do something healthy and then we go back to our old ways and why that happens. And so we dig into that and then just support each other in a really amazing, fun, private Facebook group, uh, posting uh, recipes and uh, successes. And it's amazing how in just five to seven days, how you can totally like just uplift your life and your health by getting sugar out of your diet. So if you want support in that, because everybody knows they should do it, but they don't, if you want to actually do it, um, join us for the Quit Sugar Challenge. Thanks for listening. Don't miss out on a single thing. Subscribe to our podcast and then join me at TomMoreCroft.com.